uh, today is July 30th, 2018. We're at the National uh, Convention Center in Nashville, Tennessee. This interview is conducted on behalf of the AAPM History Committee for the Archive of the AAPM. This is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Frank Boba, uh, who at the present time is at the University of Florida. I think you have been there for a bit of time. <laughs> he has a PhD in nuclear engineering uh, from the University of Florida in Gainesville. And I'm gonna skip the rest of it, so I want to you to do the, the, the talking, not me. His fellowship of the American Association of Physicists in Medicine, fellow of the American College of Radiology, fellow of the American Institute of Medical Biology, and Medic Biological Engineering, excuse me. In 1978, Dr. Bova joined the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Florida, and in 1991, he was appointed as the Albert E. and Bernie W. Einstein Fund Professor of Computer Assisted Stereotactic Neurosurgery in the Department of Neurosurgery, and in 1999, he joined the faculty of the neurosurgery at the University of Florida and was appointed professor of neurosurgery. He has developed many patents. He has all 13 patents. He also has 100, over 880 reviewed publications. Dr. 2014, Dr. Bova received uh, the University of Florida College of Medicine Lifetime Achievement Award and the University of Florida Office of Technology Licensing Inventor of the Year. Uh, I'll stop it here, if, if not, Dr. Bova will not have a chance to talk. So I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, what is your exact title right now? Uh, right now my title is Professor of Neurosurgery in the Department of Neurosurgery. Okay. Uh, some of the questions will interest me. How did you get interest in neurosurgery, in medical physics? Uh, did you have any interest in high school towards science? Uh, so we can take it from there on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I basically have always had an interest in science and technology. I actually went to a technical, I had attended a technical electronics course in, in high school and, and knew I wanted to go on to engineering at some point. Um, as, as we all know, you have very little idea of what's going to happen and what's going to spark your interest. Um, initially, I, I, I went to, uh, got my bachelor's at, at Rensselaer Polytechnic in biomedical engineering. Uh, and your and master's uh, too, am I correct? And, and my master's in, in, in biomedical engineering. Uh, and then, um, and it, as, as it happens, you know, one night uh, in a dorm, you know, talking to other people, you know, a fellow student said, you know, I, I just took this course and it was, it was, it was a nuclear, you know, nuclear medicine. And it, it seems like something you'd like. And so I, I signed up for the course at, uh, and then uh, decided that, you know, it really did interest me. I, I applied, I looked around for, for medical physics uh, curriculum and, you know, and serendipitously, uh, it turned out that as I was applying for, to different schools, uh, the first graduate of the nuclear engineering program at Rensselaer turned out to be the chairman of the nuclear engineering department at that time in Gainesville, Florida. His name was uh, Jack O'Hanion. And uh, as I called around as a, as a early graduate student trying to get interviews and things, I, I would talk to the secretary at one institution and the secretary at another institution. And I called up the University of Florida and, and the chairman would say, is that the guy from Rensselaer? Let me talk to him. And so, so uh, he recruited me down to Florida, and uh, is, it turned out that uh, you know, I, uh, I then uh, got into a, a program that was being headed up by uh, Genevieve Russell, uh, and, and uh, wound up meeting uh, my professor, you know, Walter Modley, who we could talk about in a little bit, and uh, just got into therapy physics and kind of just kept rolling. So. Okay, tell me about some of your accomplishments. There were many of them. Uh, you had developed a lot of different uh, 
treatment area or treatment modalities, if you want to call it that way, specifically neurosurgery, which yeah. is quite a field. So uh, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah I, I've, I've, I've been amazingly fortunate in that uh, I've, I, I've had some just amazing clinical partners. Um, and uh, at, in, in about uh, the, the uh, mid-'80s, um, at that point in time, I was chief of physics and radiation oncology. And, and uh, as, as you and I both know, you know, we're, we're, we are senior enough which is a nice way of saying old enough, uh, <laughs> that uh, when we started, you know, there weren't even computers. I mean, we, we remember overlaying isodose plans, doing, doing manual shifts. I remember know, those too, try, yes. Try, trying to actually, you know, uh, take two fields and add them together and figure out whether from, from a contour that you got off of a patient with a piece of solder wire and, and whatnot. And, uh, and so our, our, our careers have, have spanned from, from those very early days of literally pencil and paper uh, through today where, you know, where, where graphic processor units are, are, are cranking out calculations that, that would never, wouldn't have been possible in years of, of manual computation before. Um, and, and so I, I, I don't think there will, there will be another, could be wrong, I don't think there'll be another group of medical physicists whose lifetime will span such a leap in technology. Uh, as, as ours has, because it really says. So, so b being, being on that, being, watching that wave kind of go past, um, in, in, the, in the mid 80s, uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to be able to meet uh, my turned out clinical partner for life, Bill Friedman, and, uh, who's, who's in neurosurgery. And, uh, and Bill and I started looking at, at different things. And uh, it was, it was uh, just fortuitous that we, uh, we got involved in radio surgery, and, and at a time when, when it was just about at its infancy, and uh, were able to, to make some contributions there. Well, you have made a lot of contributions along those lines. <coughs> yeah, the uh, it, it, it was it was interesting. And I'm much rather listening coming from you, <laughs> <laughs> than for me to interject into it because, you are the one that, was smart enough, uh, to, see what needed what be possible, uh, we, we did, you and I did not dream that when we started in, in our career. Yeah. But you said we, uh, I remember taking contours of patients and uh, hoping for the best right. and trying to see how I can really modify this mm -hmm. and how accurate is this calculation. Yeah. And yeah, it, 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 was, it was surprising. I mean, I, I, I went from within a span of, of about a, a year or two when we just started developing the radio surgery, uh, you know, we, we, were, we would, be, I would be in clinic and you'd be asked to do something very accurate, you know, to a, with a small radiation field, you know, as, as like a pituitary treatment or something like that, right? where, you know, you were using like a, a four by four centimeter field, which is, was, was very small in those days and, and how difficult that was. And, and after we started within 24 months, I, I was using five millimeter fields and being able to you know, place them within a few tenths of a millimeter of their position. And, and so that, that technology, as, as we all know, you, know, you, you build on, on all the people before you and, and there was just all this work that was done for in, in the area of, of, of frame-based stereotaxis. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that existed prior to, to our work. And then, and then there was a, 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 just a, a, a very interesting set of events um, when we decided to, when we were going to look at radio surgery, there really weren't any, uh, there were no commercial Linux systems at, at that point to do it. Uh, the only machine that was really around was, was the Gamma Knife, and that was made by, by a Lexel Corporation in, in, in Sweden. And so we, we dutifully, you know, did our, we did our due diligence. We convinced the hospital that, uh, that this is the way of the future. Uh, the hospital board allocated a large sum of money, especially back in the in the uh, mid '80s. It was about five million dollars for us to go acquire. It was a lot of money at that time. It was a lot of money at that time, and, and for us to acquire the uh, the uh, uh, a radio surgery machine. And so uh, Bill Friedman and I, you know, got on an airplane and we went to Sweden, and we we actually you know visited the factory. We visited where they made it in Mutala and 
And uh, we were kind of on track to get, Pittsburgh was gonna get the first unit in the United States and we were gonna get the second unit. And uh, working towards that and working through the process, you know, getting permission for, from all the, all the uh, insurance companies and things for the payments. And, and then uh, Bill Freeman came back and he, from, from one of those ski meetings that you go to in the wintertime, you know, and it was a meeting that, you know, you, you get up in the morning, you go to lectures from six to eight, you ski from eight to five, you go to lectures from five to eight again. And uh, he came back and said, yeah, there was, there was this guy at this meeting named Ken Winston and he's, he's from, from the Joint Center, and he's, he got this, this guy you may know named Wendell Lutz. Mm, yes. And, and, and they, they, yes. they've started doing some stuff. And, you know, and, and at the time, I had been trying to push Bill Friedman in, in the direction of, of using a Linux, but, but the accuracy wasn't there. Linux back then were wasn't plus there, or minus, yeah. yeah, they were plus or minus, you know, two millimeters, so we had kind of a four millimeter of a slop, and ice concerns weren't that stable. And the gamma knife was touting that it, could, it was a, a dedicated machine built out of a giant block of metal, and it was accurate to within a, about 0.3 millimeters. And so we went up to Boston and, and looked at it and, and met Wendell and uh, Bob Sidden, you know, the group that was there, and Ken Winston, and watched them on their VAX machine, you know, start at 8 o'clock in the morning and crank out a calculation. They had, they had one chance to actually get it right because the results didn't come out till like, Three o'clock in the afternoon, and and um, and I remember that you know, and, and so they it was, and then they would have to you know, they would treat the patient. Um, it was an all all day affair, and uh, I started started tinkering with some ideas of how to actually reduce the isocentric accuracy of the accelerator, um, and and convinced Bill that that maybe we could actually build our own system. Um, he went back to the hospital. Uh, and told them that we didn't want $5 million anymore, we just wanted a half a million, and we built our own system. The hospital was delighted. Um, they had no idea at that point, you know, if we could actually do it. If I was them, I probably would have, you know, not given us the money. And we got some programmers, and we, we made a, a, a first pass to the system, and, and an idea that just, just by, you know, as luck would have it worked. And we actually got the accuracy of the, of the machine down from a, from, from several millimeters down to two tenths of a millimeter, it developed a real-time planning system that changed the calculation time from four hours. Our first pass got down from four hours to one minute, and uh, and we were able to actually start doing real-time dose adjustments, optimizing patients on the fly, um, and quickly within within about a year we were we were able to treat you know several patients in a day. Uh, then. Then, um, as other technologies started catching up with us, uh, MR scanning became important, and so the ability to actually start using image registration uh, was necessary, and and a, a few other things. Um, and so we 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 as technologies would come available, we, they'd be able to be leveraged. We brought them into the system, um, and uh, and Bill, Bill, I have to give Bill all the credit because, I. I you know, us physicists could think of a lot of wacky things to do, and Bill would actually sort them out and say, it may be a good idea, but it's actually useless. Let's not do that, Frank. <laughs> and we wouldn't do that, and he was always right. And so he, he, kept, he kept us on track and, uh, and, and just kept a, an amazing uh, amount of clinical intuition in the process that, that guided us along the way. Now, you personally developed some software for all this. Yeah, yeah, B because we, um, you know, and, and from, from a physicist's standpoint, uh, and, and being within a, neurosur a neurosurgical framework, um, I, I s you start looking at things a little differently. Um, you know, in uh, the fact that we were actually, you know, now taking radiation beams and, and targeting to within a, a couple of tenths of a millimeter um, with fused MRs and CTs, you know, from, from, from our standpoint, a radiation beam along a trajectory and, and a metal probe along a trajectory are essentially the same tool. It's just, you know, the, what, you actually, what you actually use when you're actually positioning the beam. And so we realized that the suite of, 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 uh, of software that we made for radiosurgery was just as applicable uh, in, in areas of, of neurosurgery and, and other areas. So, so we started very quickly writing versions of the code to be dedicated to the operating room. So, 
So in order, in order, instead of doing a, you know, a radio surgery, putting a head ring on and doing a radio surgical plan, we put a head ring on to do a stereotactic biopsy. Well, we, 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 we would go ahead and, and do, you know, right now our system is used uh, on a daily basis for stereotactic biopsies, stereotactic EEGs, laser ablation, deep brain stimulation. They're all, from our standpoint, very similar tools, but tools that, that um, have, have very different applications in the industry. Tell me about your old patterns. You have uh, like 13, 12, 13, something like that. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that again, there, there were, you know, I, 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 I've just been so fortunate. Well, because that must be very tough <laughs> to get those patterns approved. Yeah, yeah, it's, you, 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 almost, you, almost, you almost want to give up. It's, it's so tough because <laughs> doing, doing the technical work is the fun. Getting the patent through is by <laughs> no that, means. It's not that fun. No, no means fun because, you know, that, the patent office is there to, to guarantee that it is unique, and they, they'll challenge it, you know, and, and do their due diligence. Um, no, so again, you know, working in this in this broad environment of radiation oncology and neurosurgery, and it would happen on, on both sides. Where uh, so, you know, at, at that point in time, uh, in in the early days, the radiation oncologist who was who was pretty much working with us full time was John Bawadi, who's now at the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know we, we would we do radio surgery uh, you know and and we'd be making these you know exquisite changes in position and and then John the next day would have to go back to plus or minus five millimeters with a face mask and and so you know we, we started looking at how can we start applying some of these principles to fractionated radiation uh, to be able to get things done done more accurately and and so uh, this is prior to cone beam. CT and things like that. So, so we developed, uh, you know, uh, image guidance for for being able to reference the upper upper uh, dentition, which gave us kind of location of the skull base and external reference. So we we could do that. Uh, we did we developed uh, a 3D ultrasound system, for uh, and 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 then was able to get some NIH funding to do some uh, a bunch of work on on early prostate conformality and and adjustments. Um, and, and then we, we licensed the software to different softwares to different companies, and, and you know products started started appearing, which is which is interesting um, from a clinician standpoint. To actually, you, know, you, you do it, and 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 then some company produces it. And they never quite produce what you're using because if you're in an R and D environment at a university, you're constantly refining and doing things. So so what's out there is always just a little bit older than what you're using has a little bit of some faults that you've now corrected, but you come to a meeting like this and, and, and other physicists are now buying it and, and beating on it and basically trying to, trying to figure out the holes in it and you, you sit in the back of the room kind of waiting, waiting to cringe because someone's found some, some flaw in your code or something that you, you had not realized that you have to go fix. But, but it, it, in the end, it all, it's, it's all worked out. Did you develop your own phantoms to do all these experiments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, that, was, that was part of the, um, Part of the problem of uh, being being so early on uh, in the process is that uh, you know not only you know when when you decided you needed to get down to you know to this degree of accuracy you know we weren't even used to making measurements at that level and so uh, so the ability to to you know to go from a, a CT scan all the way down to the to, to the deposition of dose you know an end to end test didn't exist. And so one of the things we had, chambers, had, yeah, one of the things I had to do was, you know, the, 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 the actual spatial phantoms actually drag you from, from a, a stereotactic CT, fused MR, and then final position at the, at the accelerator. And plus the, the, the in order to, to make the measurements at these small fields, our chambers at that time were, were you know, we were using chambers that are, a, you know, centimeter, 12 millimeters, you know, in length, and you were trying to now measure fields that were five millimeters. And so, you know, all the, all the ability to, to, to measure those small fields had to be developed. They were being developed as you were trying to actually apply this in real time clinically. And so there was an amazing amount of, of cross-checking. And, you know, I, 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 ordered, I ordered dosimeters and phantoms from everybody I could actually find <laughs> to, to cross-reference me because I didn't want to be working in a vacuum. And, uh, and it, it, we, we, we were very fortunate. It, was, we, it turned out well. Did you develop also chambers yourself? 
Um, no, we, 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 we didn't actually, um, we, we worked with some of the vendors uh, who, were, who were doing the, the small volume chambers, um, the, the solid state detectors at the time, uh, you know, diode, diode detectors were just about coming in. And so there was, you know, angular dependence and things you had to worry about and, and characterize in order to do some of these measurements. Uh, some diamond detectors were being brought in. Uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of high resolution, uh, you know, film film work was being done. Uh, we we were using a lot of the uh, a lot of the very fine small volume powder, and 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 then going to the RPCs and people and the uh, and NIST and people like that. Back back then, it wasn't even NIST. It was the uh, you know a different name. But it was same a different thing. name. Same same group of guys, different name, guys and girls. Um, but going back and forth with them, uh, you know, tr trying to refine our, our techniques. So. I also know that you interacted a lot with the state of Florida in different ways. In the, uh, tell us about that too. That should be interesting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when I when I first got to Gainesville, um, there there weren't there weren't a lot of medical physicists back in the seventies. There there were a handful of us in the state of Florida, and uh, as 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 things as things got uh, more and more sophisticated, the po state population got higher and more and more, you know, facilities came online, the physics community started to grow. And uh, we, we initially, uh, the state realized that, that the, the industry had kind of gotten ahead of them a little bit. And um, at that point in time, uh, they, they came to the University of Florida uh, and they wanted to know if, if, if we could, first of all, educate the, the state inspectors and, and, and try to run courses for them because, you know, they, they, they couldn't hire clinical physicists at, at the state level. Um, and so they were hiring other, other scientists and we had we'd put programs together to bring them in and, and, and retrain them and things like that. And, and then also uh, when we needed to start to write the state regulations, they came back to the university and we sat down and, and helped help them write the regulations, explain what the pros and cons of the regulations would be. And so we, we, we did a lot of that. It, it, it turned out to be kind of an interesting game because, uh, you know, we, we, would, we would, you know, uh, have these sessions explain to the inspectors what was important, what wasn't important. And then these same people would come three months later to inspect our facility. And, and it, be, it became a game. And I remember once where they, they, they found it was some... It was so, a good story. Oh, it, 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 it was a, it, it was, it was a, uh, we, we, they, they came in and we're doing a user inspection and they, they found something that was not documented properly. Everything was fine, but it wasn't documented properly. And they were so proud of themselves because they got us, you know. <laughs> so, so we, uh, we had a lot of fun, fun with that. And uh, even to the point where um, back in uh, about, about 20 years ago, we, we built a, the Brain Institute at the University of Florida. And as part of the Brain Institute, uh, we were fortunate enough to put in a, a vault and, and put in a linear accelerator for just research purposes. And uh, so I have, have, I've had my own Linux for the past 20 years to do my research on. Uh, it doesn't have any, any, clinical, any clinical use. It's just research. And uh, so we licensed it. We licensed it as, a, uh, as an industrial machine. So we wouldn't have to worry about <laughs> about keeping up with the human regulations on it. This way we could take it apart, put it back together as we needed to, and do experiments with it. So the state came in, and they, they looked at it, and they said, okay, it's, uh, you know, we understand what you want to do, it's an industrial machine, but they said, you have a problem. And, we, and they said, you know, being a clinical machine, it doesn't meet one of, the, one of the regulations for an industrial machine. An industrial machine, before you turn the beam on, it has to be a large audible sound to clear the room, to clear the industrial facility before you could actually turn the machine on. And you don't have that, and you can't wire it into this easily. And so the, so the, state, <laughs> so, so the state inspector said, I have an idea. <laughs> so he shows up with a little bell, you know, that like a desk bell. that goes bing, 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 bing. And he says, okay. He says, we're going to put this on the console. He says, and you're going to hit this bell, you know, and some, some number of times before you turn the key to turn this thing on. And when I come back and inspect you in a year from now, you're gonna tell me that every time you've turned this machine on, you've hit this bell. <laughs> oh my <laughs> so, God. And so for the next, for the next eight years, <laughs> he would show up and say, okay, um, 
your audible sound? I said, I have this bell, and I hit it every time. He says, very good, and he checks it off. <laughs> so, oh, my gosh. So it tur turned out to be, you know, we, we, we've had a, a very good relationship uh, with, with the state over the years, and mm. it's, it's, been, it's been really useful. We also got, had the ability uh, to become one of the early licensing states. Mm. Um, and licensed medical physics states, and uh, that that was that was again fortuitous. Uh, we had the backing of the radiation oncology community within the state of Florida. They lent us a lobbyist um, that was very very instrumental in us being able to navigate through the capital because see, you we just do not understand how you that works all the time. Yeah, yeah, and so we we were able to to get that done, and uh, and we were we were able to get licensing uh, relatively early on. Tell me some about the teachers, the people that had an influence in, uh, in getting you into this field. Yeah. The, um, I, was, I was, again, I mean, I just, you know, as, as I look back, you, you, you don't plan, you don't plan, plan your career path. It, it, it happens to you. Um, when I got to University of Florida, I, I didn't quite understand what clinical medical physics was. And I got there, and there, there were two gentlemen there to uh, two of the professors. One's name was Dr. Walter Moderly, okay, uh, who who was a, a an older Swiss gentleman. His his doctoral professor uh, was uh, was Wolfgang Pauli, at the Swiss Institute, and uh, so he was he was of the old school, and uh, and then there was a younger a younger uh, faculty member named Larry Fitzgerald, and uh, and they, they at the time were. They were in charge of, of radiation physics, and radiology and radiation oncology were kind of all under one umbrella, and they, they took care of both sides. And they were very instrumental. Uh, as, as you know, Walter Modley was, uh, was a, a very innovative tinkerer. Yes. He made you know, very, a lot of early uh, fan, scanning systems. Uh, he, he did a lot, of, a lot of that early work in, in radiation detection made, they literally made their own chambers, they made their own amplifier systems, they made their own electronics. Um, even, even when I did my dissertation, you know, we, we had a dark room, we printed our own circuit boards, we wrapped our own wire-wrapped computers uh, back, back in those days. And, and so um, I, I got to University of Florida and uh, I was introduced to the medical physics curriculum. Uh, they taught that portion of it. Um, uh, somebody else uh, taught nuclear medicine, somebody else taught diagnostic radiology. But the, th the therapy and, and their, their, uh, uh, the way they actually uh, kind of interacted and, and the clinical contact that you were able to have in radiation oncology just drew me in. And before I knew it, I was pretty well hooked. And so uh, I did my dissertation under, under uh, Walter Marley and uh, Larry Fitzgerald was, was on my committee. And um, I was fortunate enough to graduate just about when, we, when the department bought their first high energy accelerator they needed someone to actually take care of that and, or help take care of it. I was also very fortunate um, as I uh, uh, joined, joined the group, uh, the person who was doing the, all of the day-to-day -day clinical physics and radiation oncology was a, 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 a physicist named Tom Mitchell. Tom had been trained at MD Anderson. He had actually been trained as, a, as an engineer. Um, and uh, then went back to M MD Anderson, got retrained as a, as a clinical physicist, and Tom taught me you know, everything I ever needed to know about being a clinical physicist. Moderly and Fitzgerald taught me the, the, the basics and the electronics I needed to know for the industry, and, and it, it worked out very, very well for me. Tell me about some of the people you have trained. That, that you know, when, when you get to the stage, you, you, you always wonder what's, you know, what are the interesting things about, about doing what we do, which is you know, technology development, is that you have to realize in, in three or four years what you've done that's been innovative is now of, of historical significance. And so the, the, thing, the things that, that, we, that we were proud of five years ago, I always said, you know, when, when, when you get up and you give a talk and your slides are more than three years old, you really should thought to think about retiring because you probably are starting to slip, um, unless you're giving one of the historic talks. But, um, but, uh, but then you and you realize that truly that you know, if if you are going to have some some downstream effect 
it, it's going to be through your students. And so I, I've, I've been fortunate. I, I think I just graduated my 56th medical physicist from, from my program. You know, students who I've been, you know, uh, their, their committee chairs and things like that. Um, and, and they are, um, you know, right now and all, all over the, all over, you know, the southeast. Uh, they span out to California. They're up in New York. They're up in the Midwest. They're, they're, they're at other places. And uh, that, that really is, is a satisfying part when you come to a meeting like this and, and you get to see them and, and they're all doing so well. And, and uh, I always say that, um, that being a, uh, you know, being the professor is, is, is the easy part. I, I only had to learn a couple of things. Uh, I'll tell you a story in a moment about Walter Modley, what he taught me. But go ahead, yeah, I, sure. But I, I always always say that the, the worst thing I can do is tell a student how to solve a problem, mm -hmm. because you all have to do it. The vaguer I am, the more innovative they are. It, it, it came home to me when I was when I was doing my dissertation. Um, I, I, you know, Dr. Modley had developed this this technique for for being able to make very rapid measurements in a very uh, a very steep dose gradient region. Mm -hmm. It was called repetitive integration, and it, it played with the with the RC time constant curve, and, and was very very clever, especially in, in scanning and diagnostic areas and things like that. And so uh, I was building a uh, a high energy CT scanner, a cobalt sixty CT scanner, for my dissertation, and the signal we had was literally three orders of magnitude more than he was normal used to dealing with, and the entire dosimetry section of this scanner was based on, on all these circuits he had designed over all these years. And uh, so we, we and, and the circuits just could not handle this tremendous increase in current flow that we had from the, from the signal detector. And so I had to go in one, one day as a, as, a, as a student with my notebook, and I said, Dr. Modley, I, I, have, to, I have to tell you that, um, you know, I, I've been making measurements for the past two months. I do not think this is going to work. You know, I was two and a half years into in my dissertation, and this was a disaster for me personally. I was thinking, oh, I've got to start all over again. This is, this is, you know, I'm going to run out of funding. And, and he looked at it, and he asked a few questions, and he, you know, as normally had his hands crossed in front of him. And he finally sat back and he said, I agree, Mr. Bova, it's not going to work. And I, thought, I was very despondent. And he said, do you know what we need? At that point, I thought, oh, you know, he, he, sees, he sees the path forward. He's going to explain to me what I need to do. I'm going to go out and do this. We're going to be fine. And he said, I says, what do we need? He says, what we need here is a very good idea. When you have one, come back and see me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fine. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, that's, that's just perfect. Yeah, he's not going to solve my problems for me. Uh, he's, going to, he's going to be there. I can come back and bounce things off of him. He can keep me steered in the right direction. But, but, you know, as, as a student, I, I'm going to have to actually do this on my own. And uh, I've, I've tried to practice that, too, as much as I could over the years. And it's, you know, I want the students, when they finish, to, to think. I, w I want them to not think that they've done my project. They, they need to think that, you know, I was kind of around, along for the ride. They did this. They should be proud of what they've done. And, and that, that's kind of been my goal in, in the students. Very interesting. How w what would you like to be remembered for? Oh, geez, that, that's, that's tough. I, I, I think... Um, you know, As an educator, yeah. I'm sure that you're very proud of the people you have worked with and what you have taught them. I did a lot of work, neurosurgery. But what would like, one thing that I really would like to be remembered for? You know, when we started along this path, um, and, 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 and you, you, you may remember, uh, you know, we, we, there was a lot of resistance to the change. You know, it was kind of, you know, this isn't going to work. And, and, yes. there was no, you know, and, you know, why, why would you want to do this? And, and, uh, and, and I, I, you know, and you, you go from, from literally, you know, being someone who, who, who people are arguing with on the podium in real time at meetings to, to someone who, you know, a number of years later, you realize the entire, you know, you, you guessed right. You know, and they are guesses. You've guessed right, and things have, have, have worked in, in that direction. Um, I, 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 th I, think, I think just, just you know, having, having the, the, the um, you know, to, to, to try to keep focus and to, 
to, um, you know, it, oh, I, I, I guess I, I've, I feel fortunate because I, I, still, I still get up every morning and I still love going to work. I, mean, I, love go I, I, I think it's such a privilege for what we get to do. You know, we, we get to go to work and very, very sick people get to come and they trust us with their care. And we, you know, any sufficiently advanced science is indistinguishable from magic. And, and to a lot of these people, what we do is kind of magic. We, we, we make things happen, we do. But I, I, think, I think the area of metaphysics of, of one of, you know, wor working diligently, lots of times in the background, just, just you know, with that, with that, you know, uh, with that inner drive just to make sure that every patient is treated you know, the best they possibly can. I, I think if, if someone says, yeah, he, he, that's what he did, and, um, and he, he you know, helped other people understand how to do that, I, I think that would be fine with me. Tell me something about your hobbies, your entertainments. Uh, you, know, you, you have to have <laughs> hobbies in order to be uh, able to this, this type of work. Everyone saying, well, you have to forget about it for a little yeah. bit and, and do something different. Yeah. Well, for, first of all, the, you know, uh, you know, if, if it wasn't if it wasn't for my my wife of 40 years, you know, I, I uh, you know, not not only would, would I have not made it to this stage. I, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and my, my my poor children would have suffered also. <laughs> so so the, the you know foremost you know the, uh, the 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 being fortunate enough to have to have a lifelong partner who who basically you know helped me, you know be able to spend the hours and, and, and take care of the patients as, as I needed to. The number of times that, uh, you know, I'd, I'd call up at 5.30 and say, I've got 15 more minutes worth of work. I'll be home shortly for dinner. And then, you know, you walk in at 9.30 at night because something happened with the machine. Yes, and yes. Some patient walk in. Uh, it's, it's, it's just... It sounds know, familiar. Yeah, it's just the way our lives are. Uh, the bar barber basically, you know, uh, kept, kept everything running, kept every vacation planned, kept the kids going. But... Um, uh, yeah. So, and uh, and over the years, I've 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 had you know uh, different hobbies. I, I I you know I bicycle. Um, I, I do a lot of woodworking now, uh, a lot of wood turning, those type of things. You know, pottery, uh, music. I I try to uh, th things. I I guess as I as I rattle them off, <laughs> they're all things that I do by myself in quiet. <laughs> so maybe maybe they're just my ways of. Of decompressing at, at the end of the day, but it's uh, I enjoy those those type of of things. I don't tend to have you know uh, touch feel manual manual contact. But take your mind off. Take mind off. Yeah, I, you yes. know, think 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 all those things. If if you, uh, uh, I always remember when I was uh, when I was younger, and I was doing a lot of a lot of wheel work and pottery. Uh, I had an, a, a very excellent instructor. Uh, and uh, I was I was there one night, and I was I was doing something, and I, I said, John, I, you know, I, I just for some reason I, I can't get this to work. I said, you know, what's wrong with the clay? Is it too, is it too? You know, haven't I worked it enough? It's too. I said, it just won't center. And John said back, said Frank, it's not the clay who's not centered, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and he was absolutely right. You you have to get yourself into the right mindset. Or, or you know, or you make a mistake, and the piece that you spend four hours turning on the lathe is now destroyed, or the, the pot you're throwing. To. So, the, being able to actually get into these environments where you have to concentrate and block out other things, I, I find to be uh, the whole, the working and so on and pottery. Do, did that help you in, in your work in your developing different kinds of phantoms, things like that? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting because uh, there there is there is a uh, yeah. A, a, a visualization of a 3D object that you're going to produce, and so, so the whether whether and you know and right now we're we're doing we're making a lot of phantoms by 3D printing them, or 3D printing the molds we need for the phantoms. We've been doing a lot of work on. Well, that on, should help you. Yeah, and it does. So so it's it's that you know it's, it's the ability and, and it's kind of interesting. My, my wife uh, is does a lot of botanic art. She's a, a botanist by by education, and and she. She does a lot of botanic drawing. I, I cannot do that. I do not have the ability to to draw, but I have the ability to actually draft in 3D. And so it's, it's somehow the the brains to do the, the the neural networks to do one are not the same as the other. But but uh, but being able to actually you know develop phantoms, understand 
you know, how, how something's going to look in 3D and be able to rotate it and, and be able to produce it on a lathe or, or on a wheel. Uh, they, they are all similar. So, so I, I, th I, think, I think they're not very far from, from the same skill set. Um, it just, you know, it, for, for some, you have to actually kind of forget where you are. You're not at work. That interesting <laughs> how, how you put two things together, uh, even though they, they could go into different directions like work and hobby, but you can apply your hobby to your work <laughs> and separate the two at different times. Yeah, it, it's, it really <laughs> is because, you know, you know when, when, you're, when you're making a, 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 you know, when you're, when you're on the lathe and, and you're trying to put, make a bowl or, or you're trying to make, you know, whatever you're trying to make, uh, yeah. Um, it's, it, it, is, it is a very, very different um, touch-feel type of environment. And, and you really do have to get yourself out of everything else into that moment or the, or the tool you're using, you know, it doesn't work right. <laughs> you're holding these by hand. <laughs> so what's your wife's hobby? She, she um, we, we have a very good synergistic relationship there. Um, Barbara is, as I said, about, you know, botanist, uh, horticulture. Uh, she was a county agent. Uh, and so, uh, you know, she buys, buys plants and she tells me where to dig the hole. I dig the hole. Okay. <laughs> and she doesn't plan. Okay. She, doesn't, she tells me to dig the hole and, and then she guides me on how to actually properly put the plant in the hole. But, but, it's, but I, am, I am the manual labor force <laughs> in, in that endeavor. And so we, that, that works out well. So she... Um, she does a lot of a lot of work in the yard, and uh, you know, she she loves to. That's what she really loves to do. It's a, Very yeah. interesting. I also want to mention that tonight you're getting the Quimby Award. Yes, yes. And I want to congratulate you on that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that that's a um, very well deserved. Well, thank you. It's 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 a it's a it's, a, it's an honor to to have the people who. As, as everybody knows, you know, the scientific tradition is that you publish and then your peers try to tear it apart. And, that's, that's the, and you have to embrace that if you're a scientist. And, and to have those people who, who have had this kind of, you know, role uh, basically, you know, step back and, and, and then present an award like that is, is very humbling. I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the so of I'm very the proud of it. You should be very proud of it. I'm very I, proud that, uh, uh, that you're getting it and that you, it's very well deserved. Thank you. And I want to thank you for this time and also for your friendship. Oh. We've been going for many, many, many years. Yes, it has. Thank you very much, Dr. Frank Bova, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much, Renee. You're welcome. <laughs>